Under Unit 3, our discussion is going to uh, be on the topics around derivatives and uh, what are key derivatives like futures and options and how they are useful in the world of finance. Uh, so primarily, this will cover a few uh, topics such as introductions to futures and forwards, usage of uh, futures for hedging, principles of uh, pricing of futures and arbitrage around that, basics of instruments like options, key properties of options, option pricing, and then eventually all of this and some sort of an understanding on how these instruments become useful in the financial management uh, domain as such, right? It's good to understand some of these at this point of time because they will form the crux of the way some companies manage their finances or raise money at various points of time. Also useful in terms of hedging of, uh, hedging of uh, the risks that companies face in a lot of the market. So it's important for us to understand how some of these work and what are the distinctions between something like a forward, a future, an option or something else and then try and see whether, uh, whether this fits into the overall, overall framework of financial management when a firm goes around that. Right. So we'll begin with the first part of this, which we'll discuss about primarily forwards. Right. So this particular section is going to talk about forwards and how do they work. Just before we go to the forwards, let's understand what is a derivative. Uh, a derivative is essentially, as the name suggests, uh, an instrument that derives its price from another underlying instrument or asset. Right. So if uh, if there is uh, uh, an asset whose price is moving, like let's say a stock, a derivative is basically something that derives its price from the stock price. Right. So the stock price moves in one way and then something else moves because of the price of the stock. And that's how derivative is there. The underlying asset can be immediately purchased or sold at the price called spot price. So whatever the underlying asset is, the underlying asset could be stock, it could be a commodity like cotton, it could be gold, it could be anything. And if you're purchasing this from the market, that is purchased at something known as the spot price, right? Spot price or the underlying price is what eventually guides or determines what is going to be the price of the derivative and that's why it is called as a derivative because it derives its pricing from the underlying asset, right? They usually have defined lives and we will discuss more about this as well that it could be a month, it could be two months. Usually there is a contract period, right? And we'll discuss again as we look at various kinds of derivatives, we'll look at the specifications and they're also usually zero sum contracts. Now, this we will pick up in more detail at a later stage and we'll understand what is a zero sum contract towards the end of this particular section, right? We'll leave it at this here. There are various types of derivatives, namely forwards, futures, options and something called as swaps, right? Now, for practical purposes, what is uh, going to be important is forwards and futures. The discussion is going to be largely similar. There's a small distinction between the two as we go along and discuss about it. Options are interesting instruments which come later and we'll discuss about them in subsequent sessions during this unit. Swaps may be touched upon very, you know, very, very, uh, in a very small manner at this point of time because we don't really get to use too much of those in basic financial management. When we reach advanced stages in uh, in the understanding of finance, that's when swaps will become uh, important for us as well, right? So let's first build the premise around what is a forward and how do we really understand the functionality of how a forward works, right? So let's understand the basic construct of a forward. It is an instrument that a participant uses to fix a future price for a particular transaction, right? So the transaction has to happen in the future. You're trying to fix the price today. So what's happening is you are fixing the price today for a future transaction. It's like saying after two months, I will buy something from you at a certain price. That's what is a forward agreement. Right? That's what is a forward agreement as it is called. Now to understand this better, we'll take the example of the commodities market. Consider that there is a farmer who wants to sell his rice produce two months from now, right? And he wants to sell it at rupees 90 per kg. He worries that the price could fall in this period. 
right? So he's not sure what will happen after two months. We are standing here at t is equals to zero and he has to sell it after one month and he has to sell it after two months, right? So now between this period, what will happen to the price of rice is not known, right? So the farmer worries that the price of rice will fall. So the farmer tries to find a buyer who needs rice after two months. So you obviously need a counterparty who can who can get into an agreement with you. He tries and finds a buyer uh, who who needs rice after two months. Now think about it. What is the worry of the farmer? The farmer believes that the price can fall and that is a problem because then he'll be able to sell at a lower price. What is the worry for the buyer? The buyer worries that the price might go up, right? So if I am the farmer and I believe that the prices can go down, but you are a buyer and you believe that the prices can go up, then both of us can actually fix the price at 90 rupees and both of us would be happy, right? You think it could go higher than 90, so you want to remove your risk from the entire equation. I think it can go below 90, so I want to remove my risk from the equation. What do we do? We get into an agreement. And the agreement is that the buyer will buy rice from the farmer after two months. The buyer agrees to buy it at rupees 90 per kg two months from now. So from two months from now, uh, the, the buyer says, I will buy the rice from you at rupees 90 per kg, right? So they have entered into an agreement. This agreement is nothing but what is like a forward contract, right? So far, what we have seen is that basically there has just been an agreement between two parties. We will keep removing the, the assumptions from this and keep complicating the case as we go along. The first case is when there is an agreement, right? Two months down the line, what happens to the price of rice and how does that dominate what happens to this agreement? Let's look at the structure of what happens after two months. Now, case one is let's say the price of rice falls to 85 per kg right now if the price falls to 85 per kg who is proven right the farmer felt that the price will fall the buyer said the price will go up so the farmer felt that the price will go down the buyer was worried that the price could go up who was proven right the farmer so technically who benefits here if you think about it if there was no contract, the farmer would have sold at this price. In the case of no contract, farmer would have would have sold at 85. But now there is a contract. If there is a contract, the farmer will be able to sell it at 90, which means the farmer actually gains five more than what he would have if there was no contract right and if there was no contract what would have happened to the buyer the buyer would have bought at 85 so the buyer is actually paying more because he's in a contract so technically the buyer sees a notional kind of a loss of five it's actually a loss of five because if there was no contract the buyer would have uh, would have bought it at 85 but obviously they did they wanted to de-risk themselves no one knows what will happen in the future so you have to take a call today and you decided that you will go and buy it at 90 that's fine that's that's life someone will be right someone will be wrong but if the price goes to 85 per kg the farmer sort of wins and the buyer loses the farmer gains and the buyer loses right let's think of it the other way around what happens if the price of rice is 95 per kg again in the case of no contract the farmer would have sold at 95 and buyer would have bought at 95 now the buyer gets to buy at 90 instead of 95 which is the price in the market so effectively the buyer stands to gain five right and if you look at the farmer the farmer if there was no contract could have sold it today in the market at 95 per kg 
but the farmer will have to sell it at 90 because there is a contract here so either ways whatever happens one party will win the other party will lose right so whatever happens one party is going to win this one party is going to lose this and uh, however what is happening is both the parties are basically looking at de-risking themselves so they want a fixed price in other words they do not want any volatility they don't want any volatility so no volatility is why they are entering into this forward contract that two months from now the buyer will buy this produce from the farmer at rupees 90 per kg right now let's go ahead and try and complicate this case a little bit right so the first things we come to know is that in our initial case if the market price of rice is 85 per kg the farmer has gained from the transaction if the price of rice is 95 per kg the buyer has gained from the transaction right so you only gain from the transaction when your view materializes right so what was your view the farmers view was that the prices will fall if that happened which is in this case the farmer gains from the transaction the buyers view was that the prices will go up so if that happens then the buyer gains from the transaction correct so if what your view is plays out in the market that is when you make money in the market right so that's the broad premise of how this works let's complicate it a little bit let us assume that the farmer and buyer are in different geographies if the farmer and buyer are in different geographies then logistically it is not possible for the buyer to buy rice from the farmer because the transaction and shipping cost will will add significantly right you can't buy 1 kg at 90 rupees if you are in different geographies let's say they are in different countries altogether if they are in different countries then what do they do right so from that perspective now there is a problem because they still have that viewpoint the farmer believes prices 